The colonial period in North America, which spans from the founding of the Jamestown Colony in 1607 to the Declaration of Independence in 1776, harbored a period of conflict and war. One of the earliest wars was the Anglo-Powhatan War between the Powhatans and the English colonists, which lasted from 1609 to 1614. Fueled by clashes over territory, resources, and cultural differences, this war marked a defining chapter in early American history. Tensions escalated as both sides sought dominance, resulting in battles like the infamous Starving Time for the English and the indigenous resistance led by Chief Powhatan. The conflict significantly altered the course of relationships between Native Americans and European settlers. But what drove the initial encounters to this conflict? How did the war reshape the relationship between the Powhatan people and the English settlers? And what lasting impacts did the first Anglo-Powhatan War leave on the shaping of the New World? Stick around as we unravel the full details of the first Anglo-Powhatan War, dig into its root causes, and how it was brought to an end. As you watch this video, help us hit the like button, subscribe, and turn on the notification bell. Thanks for joining us once again. As history has shown, native Indians tend to be patient. However, after three years of dealing with English arrogance and bullying, the Indian people of Virginia had had enough. The Powhatan felt that the advantages of trading with the English were not enough to warrant the difficulties they caused. Thus, the year 1609 marked the beginning of the First Anglo-Powhatan War. The war was a period of sporadic violence, in which the two sides fought according to different rules of engagement. However, before discussing the war, let's reveal the events leading up to the war. The Indians of Tsenacomoco had encountered Europeans before. In 1570, Don Luis de Velasco, an Indian who had left home on a Spanish ship, converted to Catholicism and changed his name, returned to the Chesapeake with a party of Jesuit missionaries. Several months later, he led Indians on a raid that killed all the Spaniards except for a young boy. During the winter of 1585 to 1586, a party of Englishmen from Roanoke visited the Chesapeake Indians, and sometime after 1587, the so-called lost colonists may have gone to live either among that same group or with Indians closer to Roanoke. Either way, Various Powhatans told the Jamestown settlers that the Mamanatawik had ordered the earlier colonists killed. Historians disagree over whether these rumors were true or deliberately planted in an attempt to intimidate the English. When the Englishmen built a fort on the James River on May 1607, they chose their site based on how best to defend themselves from the Spanish, not the Indians. Powhatan was more concerned with, among others, the powerful Monacans, who lived beyond the fall line than with this small party of soldiers. Rather than immediately kill them, Powhatan endeavoured to learn more about them. While arranging for a party of English explorers to be feasted, he ordered those who remained at Jamestown to be attacked, presumably so he could test their weapons and tactics. As the colonist Gabriel Archer noticed, the Indians quickly learned not to approach scarcely within musket shot, while the colonists learned to fear ambush from the tall grass and divers arrows at random. Captain George Percy called Powhatan the subtle old fox, and this was one occasion where he earned the nickname. Pretending not to have authorized the attack, Powhatan told the colonists that he now would protect them. In this way, he kept the English off guard and compounded for them what already was a confusing situation. Were they at war or peace? Were they dealing with a friend or foe? In December 1607, a communal hunting party led by Powhatan's younger brother, or close relative, Opechankano, captured John Smith eventually delivering him to Werewakomoko on the York River. There, according to legend, Pocahontas saved the Englishman's life. But many scholars now believe that Smith instead may have undergone an adoption ritual whereby Powhatan attempted to absorb the colonists into his chiefdom. Offering Smith the title of Werowance, or chief of the village of Kapahosik near Werewakomoko, Powhatan hoped to place the Englishman where he could more closely watch him. Smith declined, declaring his allegiance to King James the Wuss, but later that year, he attempted, more or less, to adopt Powhatan. In September 1608, Smith and Captain Christopher Newport awkwardly crowned the Mamanatuic to make him subject to the English king. Powhatan accepted their gifts, but soon after cut off trade with the English. The weather, meanwhile, complicated matters. The colonists had arrived near the beginning of a devastating seven-year drought between 1606 to 1612. The driest stretch in 770 years, accompanied by particularly fierce winters. Food, especially corn, was at a premium, and the colonists had come to Virginia unprepared and, for the most part, disinclined to fend for themselves. 
Supplies from England had not been adequate to keep them alive, and they had been unable to assume control over Powhatan's tribute system, as they knew the Spanish had done with the Indians in South America. As the English quickly died of malnutrition and disease those first two years, gifts of food from the Indians saved the colony. But the drought continued, and Smith supplemented those gifts by aggressively bargaining for corn and often outright stealing. When Powhatan halted trade, he created a serious crisis for the Jamestown settlers. In May 1609, the Crown issued the Virginia Company of London a second charter and dispatched a fleet of ships, additional colonists, and supplies. The flagship sea venture, however, appeared to be lost at sea, taking with it the colony's new leadership. Political chaos resulted at Jamestown, with then-President Smith feeling beset both by critics and the threat of famine. Late in the summer, in an effort to relieve conditions at the fort and perhaps to relieve himself of his critics, he sent two groups of soldiers to live off the land. Downriver, a party led by Captains Percy and John Martin, attempted to meet with the Nansamund Indians, but after two of the colonists' messengers disappeared, the Englishmen attacked a nearby settlement. Percy later reported that his soldiers burned their houses, ransacked their temples, took down the corpses of their dead kings from their tombs, and carried away their pearls, coppers and bracelets, wherewith they do decorate their king's funerals. The fighting that resulted led to half of Percy and Martin's hundred men being killed. Another party, led by Francis West and including a well-heeled 14-year-old named Henry Spellman, travelled upriver to the falls of the James River. There, the colonists negotiated with another of Powhatan's brothers, Parahunt, for rights to the village of Powhatan. Not interested in giving up the Mamanatawik's hometown and its harvest-ready corn, Parahunt's warriors resisted, and the fighting cost West half of his 120 men. In the end, a truce was partially brokered by sending Spellman to live with Parahunt. Spellman later wrote that Smith had sold me to him. These bloody confrontations on both ends of the James, combined with Englishmen challenging the sovereignty of a town as symbolically important as Powhatan, finally led to the outbreak of war. Smith left the colony in October 1609, and in November, young Spellman travelled to Jamestown with an invitation from Powhatan for the English to visit his new capital at Oropax. Instead of finding corn for trade, however, the colonists, led by Captain John Ratcliffe, walked into an ambush. About 33 men, or two-thirds of their number, were killed. The Indians captured Ratcliffe, and their women skinned him alive using mussel shells. Spellman was horrified by what had happened, and fled Powhatan to live among the Patawomeks. Shortly thereafter, all but a handful of the colonists retreated to Jamestown, and the Mamanatawik ordered his warriors to cut off trade to the fort and access to the surrounding woods, where the colonists might hunt or forage. If it was not quite a siege in the conventional sense, it had a similar effect. There was no need to fight the Englishmen and their muskets head-on. He would let famine do the work for him. This was Powhatan's best chance to win the war and to evict the English colonists from Senna Comico. Over the winter, the 240 men, women and children at James Fort endured the starving time, during which they fed on snakes, rats, mice, musk turtles, cats, dogs, horses, and possibly even each other. By May 1610, only about 60 of the colonists remained alive. Remarkably, the Sea Ventures passengers and crew arrived at Jamestown on May 24, having survived in Bermuda for 10 months. One of the new colonists, William Strachey, later wrote that the particulars of the famine and pestilence he found within the fort were more than I have heart to express. Sir Thomas Gates opted to abandon Virginia, but as the colonists sailed down the James, they encountered a ship bearing the new governor, Thomas West, Baron de la War, and a year's worth of supplies. Faust describes de la War's arrival and the new vengeful resolve that took root among the colonists as the critical turning point in the First Anglo-Powhatan War. Rumours suggesting that Powhatan ordered the death of the lost colonists, possibly aiming to showcase the extent of the Mamanatawik's influence, played a role in fueling a conflict between the Jamestown settlers and the indigenous people, escalating tensions into a perceived holy war. Governor de la War and Lieutenant Governor Gates came to Virginia with instructions from the Virginia Company to capture Powhatan and kill his Kwiokosuk, or priests, whom the colonists believed to have advised the Paramount Chief to destroy the Roanoke remnant. Werowances, meanwhile, were to be made to redirect their annual tribute to the English, and all Indians, but especially their children, were to be educated in English ways and converted to Christianity. Discipline among the colonists was critical. 
Toward that end, Gates implemented a set of rules governing the behavior of military personnel. Later edited and published by William Strachey as The Law's Divine Morale and Martial, 1612. The rules, especially as expanded in 1611 by Sir Thomas Dale, were so strict as to provoke a backlash in England. A man accused of stealing food, for example, was bound to a tree until he starved. Although, for the time being, they helped bring stability to a colony that had long teetered on the edge of the abyss. Then, on July 9, 1610, the English launched a vicious counterattack against the Powhatans. During the starving time, 30 colonists had been garrisoned, with plenty of food, at Fort Algernon near the mouth of the James. The nearby Cacofton Indians had let them be, but now the English, in the ironic words of George Percy, were desirous for to be revenged upon the Indians at Cacahuatan, drawing the warriors to the riverbank using a drummer who mimicked a traditional Powhatan greeting, the English launched an attack on the Cacotans. According to Percy, they caused such extraordinary large and mortal wounds that it seemed strange that anyone managed to escape. Not long after, a group of Paspahue Indians, whose territory Jamestown was situated in, attacked the blockhouse guarding the peninsula's entrance from the mainland. By way of retaliation, a force under the joint command of Captains Percy, John Davis, and William West attacked the Paspahue town, killing 15 or 16 people, burning houses, and taking corn. The wife and children of the Waroans Wawinchopunk were captured, but Percy wrote that, My soldiers did begin to murmur because the queen and her children were spared, when other captives had been killed. So upon the same a council was called, and it was agreed upon to put the children to death which was effected by throwing them overboard and shooting out their brains in the water. Shortly afterward, while returning to Jamestown, the children's mother was executed, likely by Davis. The Waraskoyaks and Chickahominis, the latter not members of Powhatan's paramount chiefdom, also were attacked. After the Waraskoyaks fled, the colonists burned two of their villages and harvested the remaining corn. In the coming years, the English would use in Ireland various tricks of colonialism they had learned in Virginia. During the First Anglo-Powhatan War, however, they brought to Virginia terror tactics perfected in Ireland. Specifically, as Faust has written, their use of deception, ambush and surprise, the random slaughter of both sexes and all ages, the calculated murder of innocent captives, the destruction of entire villages, all were new to America. While the Indians could be just as violent as the English, certain restraints were built into their method of waging war. The practice of avenging particular slights tended to personalize and limit the scope of conflict. The Indians' desire to take prisoners also acted as a restraint. Prisoners served as symbols of success and targets for rage. They could also serve as adoptees into the chiefdom or hostages to be traded. Because it threatened the lives of these potential prisoners, unlimited violence was not always useful. In addition, Indians traditionally spared the lives of chiefs, women and children. As the First Anglo-Powhatan War escalated, however, fewer restraints were in evidence, and descriptions by the colonists of the Powhatans calling on their god Oki suggest that both sides may have seen themselves in a holy war. In November 1610, De La War sent a large expedition of perhaps 200 men, including miners, west toward the Falls of the James. After an initial defeat at the hands of the Appomattox Werowanskwa, or female chief Opasunokwanuski, the colonists destroyed the Appomattox village and severely injured the Werowanskwa. The drummer who had tricked the Kakutans just barely escaped the Indian's special attempts to kill him. William West, the governor's nephew, and Wawinchopunk, the Paspahi Werowans, were both killed later on in the continued tit-for-tat battles. By the beginning of 1611, the war's momentum returned briefly to the Powhatans. First, they pushed the colonists back from the falls. Then, on March 28, an Ile de la War sailed for the West Indies, leaving George Percy in charge pending the arrival of the new deputy governor, Sir Thomas Dale. Seizing the opportunity of a power vacuum, just as they had done after Smith's departure in 1609, several hundred warriors, led by the revenge-seeking Paspahees, attacked the Jamestown blockhouse. Percy described arrows as thick as hell that killed the blockhouse's entire garrison of 20 men. But when the Powhatans refused to risk attacking James Fort, they lost perhaps another opportunity to end the war. Instead, Dale took over in May and proved to be a ruthless disciplinarian and canny strategist. He expanded the laws divine, morale and martial, and took Richard Hacklate, the younger, stern advice that, if gentle polishing of the Indians will not serve, then we shall not want hammerars and rough masons enough to prepare them to our preacher's hands. 
In June, Dale led a hundred armored soldiers against the Nansamans at the mouth of the James River, burning their towns. Then in September, after receiving a shipload of reinforcements, the colonists attacked upriver, gaining enough ground to found the new settlement of Henricus. In December, Dale's men used Henricus as a launching point for new attacks, defeating the Appomattox once and for all. Dale now had the Mamanatoic stuck in a vice between the English gains on both ends of the river and the Monacans and other non-Algonquian speakers beyond the falls. For the next two years, the elderly Powhatan could do little but lie low, his authority weakened. Indications of this are the number of English plantations established along the James despite periodic Indian resistance. Meanwhile, Captain Samuel Argol explored the northern, more vulnerable reaches of Tsenakomoko and found the Patawamex to be especially willing trading partners. This was partly due to the influence of Henry Spellman, the young boy who had fled Powhatan in 1609 after the ambush of John Ratcliffe's party. Having matured into a reliable interpreter, Spellman now served as a liaison between Argol and Iopassus, Japazos, Werowants of the Patawomek town of Pasapatanzi. The relationship bore unexpected fruit when, in April 1613, Argol learned that Pocahontas was staying in Pasapatanzi. Using the stick of English military might and the carrot of a potentially lucrative partnership, Argol convinced Iopassus to help him kidnap Pocahontas, ironically giving to the English what the Indians traditionally prized in war, a valuable prisoner. As for Spellman, he seemed to personify the blurred lines between friend and foe, native and English, war and peace. A few years later, he would just escape execution on the charge of bad-mouthing the English to Opechankana. After concluding treaties with the Akamaks and Okahanaks on the eastern shore, Argol and his superior Dale attempted to use Pocahontas to win concessions from her father. But for a year, Powhatan only stalled until, in March 1614, Dale, Argyll and 150 English soldiers, with Pocahontas in tow, paddled deep into Pamunkey territory, home to Opechankano and Senecomico's most fearsome bowmen. At present-day West Point, where the York and Mataponi rivers meet, the Englishmen disembarked and faced down several hundred Indians. When, after two days, neither side was willing to fire first, the colonists returned to Jamestown. The war ended on a note of anti-climax. The first anglo powhatan War had begun with a truce and a cultural exchange when young Henry Spellman went to live with the Werowance Parahunt. Now it ended with another truce and cultural exchange. This time, Pocahontas, Powhatan's half-sister, decided to remain among the English. During the stalemate of 1612 to 1613, she converted to Christianity, and in April 1614, the English informed her father that she intended to marry John Rolfe, one of the Sea Venture's passengers. Powhatan assented. The English and the Indians did not share many understandings about war, but they agreed that this marriage could bring peace, and for a while, it did. Although Pocahontas died in England in 1617 and her father a year later, the peace held, and the English took advantage by expanding their settlements far beyond Jamestown. After Rolfe introduced a saleable grade of tobacco to the colony, plantations were established up and down the James while the Indians bided their time. The title of Mamanatuic did not immediately transfer to Opechankana, but as the Werowance of the Pamunkey, he controlled the last great stronghold in Senecomico. The English, meanwhile, took Pocahontas's conversion as a sign that all of the Powhatans were prepared to abandon their traditions. Even Opechankana seemed to flirt with conversion. As Haklut had predicted, English hammerors had readied the Indians to our preacher's hands, or so it seemed. On March 22, 1622, Opechankanov's warriors struck the colony suddenly and without the usual restraint, launching the Second Anglo-Powhatan War. On that note, we end today's episode. Thank you for joining us once again. We hope you enjoyed this video. Remember to hit the subscribe button and turn on the notification bell so you will be the first to see our new updates.